Well, I want to introduce what we're doing in today's video. Uh, since I've started this YouTube channel about two weeks ago, I went from a full-time uh, horse logger to uh, I took a job as a uh, log buyer for a company. Uh, I've done that quite a bit through the years. I've bought a lot of logs for companies through the years. Uh, most of them are a general saw log. Uh, where I'd go in and buy every species of hardwood um, that, that would make saw lumber and veneer. And uh, this job's a much more specific job. Uh, I'm buying white oak saw logs uh, strictly for, uh, that's the only species I buy, and it's for the barrel industry. You guessed it, I'm part of the bourbon boom. And I believe we're the only uh, stave mill in New York State, we're quite a bit further north than the rest of the stave mills. Of course, one reason is we don't have a lot of white oak around here, and it's not as good a quality as it is in some of the other places, uh, by and large. Um, and sometimes we do run into good pockets. Anyway, uh, I work for Finger Lakes Forest Products. Uh, the mill's in uh, Ovid, New York, up there, Romulus, uh, top of Seneca Lake. And uh, I travel around to different log yards mostly and, and sawmills and buy a specific log that'll make a stave log. Generally, we focus between 11 inch logs and uh, maybe 20 to 22 inches. Um, we get much bigger than that. It's hard to process through our equipment. Uh, you can't get any smaller than that, it's just junk. Uh, our sweet spot is probably a 14 to 18 inch log, is what we like. Butt log is even better uh, because of core defects, and we're gonna get into that eight times throughout this video. Um, anyway, uh, that's, that's kind of what we filmed today, and I, I didn't introduce it very well. Uh, Colin Dean is the owner and founder of this company, and uh, it was his vision. And what we do, we, we buy the white oak for whiskey and wine barrels. And then we saw that into what's called a stave. And that is the wooden part that makes the barrel. Both the round part around the sides and the top part. Um, is a, They're called stave logs. And, and we actually make the staves. Uh, Generally, it's a 39-inch. Sometimes we have some special orders for a little bit longer for the wine industry. It's a 39-inch product. It's kind of similar to baseball bats. We cut our logs into 39-inch bolts with a few short ones to make the barrel tops and bottoms. Um, and then from there, we quarter saw the log. Uh, I guess I uh, already made a... Hey, uh, I had Nick do it for me because my penmanship is so awful. Uh, refer back throughout this video to a video I did a week or so ago about core defects, and it explains why we value logs a certain way. Um, but before we even get into that, let's talk about white oak and a true white oak. Why barrels are made of white oak. They're the only thing that, uh, that hold water consistently. Uh, if you take uh, average wood, this is cherry that Nick cut for firewood today. You take cherry, ash, maple, uh, red oak. You can almost drink water. You can, and people have told me they've done this in forestry school. You can actually use that like a straw and suck through that and, and drink water through the wood. You can't do that with white oak because of the way the cells are in the wood. And that's why white oak is what's used for barrels. In the uh, bourbon industry, uh, the barrels are a one-time use, and, and that's regulated by law. That's all you can use on a bourbon barrel is one time, and it has to be white oak, regulated uh, by law, just like everything is here in America. Um, you know, land of the free, right? But anyway, it's the only thing that works, so I, I guess I should not go on a political rant and keep it focused here. Um, white oak's the only thing that works for it. Uh, Wine barrels are a little bit higher grade, a little bit, take a little bit better log and, and a little bit better quality piece of wood to make, and they can be used uh, repeatedly. Uh, the whiskey barrels go to, a, the staves we make go to a cooperage, and the coopers turn them into barrels, and then they char them with flames, and uh, 
turn them into whiskey that, uh, you know, that we all enjoy responsibly. Right, Nick? Yep. Yep. <laughs> anyway, uh, throughout this video, I'm going to refer to core defects and I want you to refer back to the video, but, uh, at a glance, uh, we'll talk about core defects. This is a young tree. This is a really simplified overview here. This is a young tree. These are the branches. Uh, those branches stay the same height as that tree grows. So if this is a branch here and you hang your hat on that branch, you come back 10 years from now, that branch doesn't move up. That branch stays right where it is. Uh, they always do. Otherwise, you'd hang a, a fence, a posted sign, something like that on the tree, and it would go up the tree, and that's not the case. A tree gets its height first, and they grow branches, and as the tree gets older, these branches kind of die off. After it gets its height, it gets diameter. Uh, and then... Uh, these branches die and they stay closer to the center. So this was step one with a young tree. Here's an intermediate immediate age tree. You can see all these branches are the core defects and they're close to the outside. Uh, you only have a little bit of usable, clean, defect-free lumber. This is a much more mature tree and you see all these branches are closer to the center. You have much more usable space. Also notice your butt log has a lot more usable space than anything further up the tree because the further up the tree you go and the smaller the tree is, the closer core defects are to the center and the closer these branches and defects get to your tree, uh, to your actual product, to your log and to your lumber. And uh, what happens is, is any defect, uh, they just don't hold water. They just don't hold liquid. Um, so it has to be a clean piece of lumber. Step two, as I said, we cut that, uh, we cut that log into our bolt lengths, our, our 39 inch or whatever order we're filling length. And then we quarter saw that. And I'm going to show the quarter sawn process here at a glance. Excuse my terrible artistry. But it gives you the general overall picture what quarter sawn is. So there's the end of a log if you're looking at the end of it. First step, we run it through a uh, uh, machine, a head saw that splits that right in half, right through the heartwood and right in half. We often look for the, the natural check, the, the flitch on the wood, and we go right in half. Now we have two halves after we do that, half and half. Um, from those halves, we say this is the one half over here. Uh, as you're looking at the camera, your left. Uh, then we take that and we split it again. We split the half again and, and we make quarters out of it. Just like splitting a piece of firewood into four pieces, we, we make quarters out of it. Now, each of those quarters goes through our, our process, like our uh, um, resaw, and, and then through our edger and so forth. But, uh, and it gets quarter sawn. So we saw a piece this way, a piece this way, a piece this way, this way, till we're out at the edge. And uh, that makes the grain very strong they also do this in a flooring process but you know terrible artistry but if you're imagining this is how your growth rings grow quarter sawn a lot keeps that grain like this at an angle and and that's what holds water and that's what makes a real strong piece of wood is to be quarter sawn um, you use a lot more wood in this process also as opposed to regular lumber where uh we'll use the bottom where i haven't drawn we just Whoop, we saw a board, we saw a board. Good thing we're about done with this. We're about out of ink here. We saw a board. Instead, we quarter saw it. Much more labor-intensive process, but we get that grain running the right direction to use in our barrel company and to make a whiskey or a wine barrel from, or a good piece of flooring as well. So uh, that's just a little introductory as to why... Uh, I don't think I explained that in the later videos, but that's just a little introductory as to uh, 
the market I'm working for and uh, what I'm buying some logs for. Now don't fear, I'm still a horse logger and you're still gonna get lots of horse logging and farming and training horse videos. Um, you know, you can't get me away from that stuff. Uh, but I gotta keep the wolves away and uh, call me a sellout if you will, but I, I had to do it. I had to take a job as a, as a stay vlog buyer. Uh, so here I am doing that. Nice small company, you know, not a big corporate operation. Uh, you know, I like it. We, we create some local jobs up there in Ovid. We've got a staff of about 10 people working in that stave mill, you know, create some other jobs. I'm the buyer. Uh, you know, we got some log truck drivers hauling in, some lumber truck drivers hauling out. So um, kind of good for the economy. Keeps everybody going. And, uh, you know, if loggers are using responsible forestry, we, uh, you know, we keep a sustainable uh, forests throughout here too. And, uh, that means quite a lot to Colin and I as, uh, as the owner and, and log buyer for the company. So just an introductory to this video and, uh, I hope it's informative and, and works for you and you can learn from it. Um, like I said, this is specific to the stave log industry, but a lot of these tips and things I talk about, uh, translate through the whole logging industry, especially hardwood industry. So I hope you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. Uh, we're uh, closing in on a thousand subscribers and lots of viewing hours, and, and I think we're doing pretty well for a young YouTube channel. And I um, think I might go live here real soon, possibly even this weekend, and uh, answer some questions and uh, have a good time with y'all. Um, give me your feedback and let me know what you think about that. So uh, enjoy the video we made today, and... Uh, We'll do more later. My name's Colin Dean. We're uh, in a log yard here in New York. Uh, I'm the owner of Finger Lakes Forest Products. We have a stave mill in Ovid, New York, and we're here buying uh, white oak stave logs. Yep, and with us today is Scott Harris and Chris Hatch. They're helping us through the sale. Yep. So hopefully it'll be a good one. You guys will be happy when we're done. Well, the first step when I'm buying stave logs or saw logs or anything, especially when they're laid out neatly like this, I look at the butt ends. I make sure there are no cutbacks uh, due to poor cutting or uh, hollow spots or anything like that. So I've already done this. I've already marked them, but we're going to take you around and show you. There's a really nice bunch of logs here. Um, Right now we're looking at the butt ends. This, I'm actually going to scale this end when I get ready. This is actually the top end. This log branched into two pieces. And uh, and that's, somebody did a really good job cutting that. You wanna go up into that crotch, just enough to where you see bark like this. And uh, I'm gonna call that an 18 inch log when I scale it. Uh, I think it's a 16 footer, I better measure it. Uh, Yeah, this is a 16 footer, so I'm gonna mark that so I don't forget later. And I have a series of marks I use um, so I know what I'm looking at when I get to the other end. Uh, this is a good log that we're paying good for. This is 25 feet in length. That gives me two 12 foot logs. And the 12 foot butt log is worth considerably more then the second log, if you refer back to a video we had about core defects, it will explain why the butt log is worth more than the second log. So as I'm going around, uh, this log just doesn't work for us. To begin with, it's, uh, it's not a true white oak. It's much more of a, a chestnut or a swamp oak. It's knotty and it's crooked. Uh, it'll go through the mill and make some flooring or some lumber, but it won't um, work for us for what we do for uh, staves. This is a good one here. Uh, just a little something on the butt, but I'm not going to cut any linear footage back because of that. That doesn't go in very deep. Just a touch of, uh, of felling damage. Uh, probably would have been avoided if they'd have cut the center out, but 
again, it's not bad. If you can maybe show this a little close up, Colin. Uh, right there is our felling damage. It's not bad, and it, it's probably within the um, within the trim, which is which is to say, if a, this log is ten foot six instead of ten feet long. And as long as that damage stays within that six inches, we're fine. Um, somebody did an overall good job cutting that tree, but um, you know, you don't win them all. I marked this one. This is a particularly good log, so I marked it. This one is a, uh, a pair of nine footers, and I, and I marked what I'm going to do. And just a lot of these are, don't need an explanation. They're just good logs. So I'll just walk on down through. Here's another one. I actually did take just a touch. So this log is a 10 foot log. And uh, we might even want to show this a little, Cowan. Uh, this is a 10 foot log, pretty good white oak. I'm going to buy it as a nine because of this felling damage, because of the, the fracture there. Um, so instead of a 10, I'm going to buy that as a 9 to get behind that. That'll go in a ways, um, but still a, a good log. And that's another reason to cut 10s. You, you have a little wiggle room. Uh, overall, somebody did a very good job cutting and trimming. Uh, you know, this is a, a terrific job here. Uh, not a lot to know the effect on the whole layout. I think that was the only... The only cutback I had, and from there I uh, I walked down the tip end of the logs at a glance, and I uh, I tentatively grade these. And uh, if you come around, I'll kind of show what I did. Um, I put a series of marks on here so I know how I'm going to grade this log and what grade I'm going to call it. And Colin, who's running the camera, he's my boss, so he knows when it gets to the mill that I graded it a certain way, and we'll put it through the mill accordingly, whether it's for wine barrels, which are a higher quality, or for whiskey barrels, which are a little bit lower quality. And Colin can check at a glance that, why did he put three dots on that log? Hey, Brant's got to tighten up, he can't be paying that. <laughs> or, why'd he put three dots? He should have put two and paid better on it. and that's a good 10. I, I thought maybe it was a short one, but it, it's a good 10 foot. And so I just continue. I walk right down the, the tips. My grades for the different grades I use depend on uh, several things. Uh, first is diameter. You know, a good diameter. This is going to be called a 16 inch log. That's a good diameter and that'll really work well for us. Uh, for instance, uh, this log is only 13 inches and it's a fine diameter, but we, we can't get as much out of it as the 16 inch log. So it goes down actually two grades on this one. Um, and again, core defects. If you refer to that video, you'll see the difference in, uh, uh, maybe I'll put a, a chart I'll insert it in here or something but you'll see why a little bit bigger diameter works better and those core defects don't get into our lumber uh, this log got downgraded to our lowest grade actually because it's uh, probably a third cut log the third log up a tree so we look at diameter you know length for our business we, we do a lot of 39 inch stuff and uh, there are certain lengths that work for us real well and we look at knots. Uh, this is a very clean run of logs. I'm looking for an example to show you, and I'm not finding many knots. Uh, but I guess I will show you the, uh, the growth rings. We also consider the growth rings in these white oak, and we want tight growth rings. It holds water better and makes a better barrel. So what did that fella show us? Mark Knapp. This is roughly an inch. I got a big yep. hand. That might be bigger than an inch, but that looks to be something like 15 growth rings per inch. Which is good, yeah. I'm going to tee off on that log and call it a, a really good grade. And I still haven't found one with many knots. 
we look at a straight log. Uh, we are cutting them in short lengths. This log sweeps a little bit, but um, because we cut them into short lengths, we can get away with a little bit more. Um, this is also a good log, but it's only an eight footer. That's all the logger could get. And that will downgrade it a little too, because we end up with a lot of waste for our product with eight footers. So here's one that's one of our lower grades and it has some knots on it. And, and those knots uh, definitely affect our product and we have to try to cut between those knots. This next little guy is just too many knots and too small a diameter. I did not buy that one. So uh, I have a process. I walk around one direction, the butts of the logs, come back the other direction when I mark them and then when I scale them I walk this other direction that way I've seen every angle of that log and I try to do that everywhere I go and uh, make sure I, I see the because if I'm always walking like this and scaling which is what I tend to do when I'm scaling um, I might miss a defect over here and I might misgrade that log or or not use it correctly so I try to walk every angle um, I guess now I'll uh, I'll get these tagged up, and we'll enter them into a handheld system and grade them and try to find a truck to haul these. Actually, we have one all booked. Thank you, Kellen Dance. <laughs> Do it here and there. Tell me when you're on. Yep, go ahead. So we tag every log, and our tags have a uh, barcode, as you see. And FLFP, Finger Lakes Forest Products, and an individual number. And we can reference that. And um, we know how many logs we bought, how many are delivered in. And to scan that tag, we can tell uh, what I paid for that log and, and where it should go in the mill. This log is a double. A, uh, the 25 footer we looked at earlier. I can do that two ways. I can put two tags in the tip. The uh, lower number is the, always the tip and the higher number is the second log. It's understood throughout our industry. Or if we come forward, I can do this another way. And I can actually put a tag on each end of this log. The doubles don't work bad for us because we cut a lot of different lengths and some of our orders are different lengths. They're not a, always 39 inches. And we need tops for the barrels, which can be as short as what, 18 inches? 18, yep. As short as that, up to maybe 24? 24, 25, and then some of the smaller barrels will even go down to 13 inches. Yeah, so we can, uh, we can utilize that, however, to fit our own orders when they're cut a double like this. end of every 40 tags we have to put a new row in and this little piece of plastic that holds the tags together falls out I try to always make it a point to pick that up a lot of people just don't want the trash laying around uh, one time I actually picked up a, a really good customer that we dealt together for years and that's what he liked was that I said why did you deal with me you told me you're gonna deal with another company and uh, but you chose me instead and he said, because I'm conscientious and I picked these up. The smallest thing in the world, but it made a difference. That was a uh, Mark and Sue Keister from Keister Forestry. Um, and we've done a lot of business together since then, and I appreciate that. So I always try to pick these up and, and be aware. 
I lost my other row of tags. I was going to show how I put that in, but it fell out of my pocket somewhere. I guess we better start again here. <laughs> well, we just had a big search for a lost row of tags. And anybody paying attention in this video realizes I actually inserted those into the, the sleeve while I was talking. And I didn't realize they were in here ready to go. And we had, we had four guys looking around for a row of tags. But uh, we like to keep them in order. It helps our... Uh, our uh, our system, our tracking system. So. Uh, now, if we are out of order on the tags, I will actually do this. Like if I have to start a new box or they don't go in order anymore, and we need to uh, note that in our computer that we're on a different row because it goes up sequentially. I'll actually take this sleeve and I'll drive it right in like that and that'll remind me to start a new number. I'll just get these tagged up and on to the uh, better stuff of uh, grading and scaling and uh, getting some guys a nice check for these logs. This one will be a 12, 13, 22, 50. So what we do on a log like this the tip of this measured 13 inches and the butt log we're going to call a 14 inch we, we give it one inch for the taper we buy white oak you could almost make a case that we should give it two inches and so with that in mind i try to give a generous diameter and, and kind of meet in the middle so this uh tip of this will be a, a mid-grade log and the butt end of this log will be our highest grade. And really from the outside, they look like about the same log, but the butt is bigger and of course closer to the bottom and we it'll saw much better lumber for us. Grading and scaling these logs, right now the hard part's done, grading. We're scaling these and uh, we use a Doyle scale. It's standard around here where I live. Uh, there are, uh, just a couple companies on Scribner. Most everything's done Doyle. And what the scale is, is a, uh, a system to estimate how many board feet of lumber this log is going to cut. So this log is a 10 foot, 14 inch log. And it's just like a graph. Uh, 10 feet. I might've got mad and smacked something with my stick and broke it and had to put a little tape on there one day. 10 feet. And Scott said it before we got there, 14 inches is a 62 board foot log. And in all reality, if we ran that through a mill, it'll probably cut you 70, 72 feet of lumber. Doyle scale is, it favors the sawmill. My dad always used to say that the, uh, it eliminates the can. It eliminates the can and it gives you four inches of slab. You know, my, my dad always said that Doyle scale he didn't know anything about Mr. Doyle, but he knows damn well he's a sawmill man, not a logger. $10.14, So this is why it was important uh, that I walk around all angles. I actually missed this uh, felling damage on a really good log. It's also important why we cut the center out of the hinge if you refer back to some of those videos and, and shorts. Uh, but if you show from the side, Colin, this goes nearly the length of this 10 foot log. It's all the way up into here. And, and I actually will buy this and use this log, but I have to make a major deduction because of that. This would have been our, our as a stave mill, highest grade, possibly even a uh, veneer log. But this split, and you can see, I'll, I'll get my uh, handy dandy log rule. That's pretty deep and, and it goes in there a long ways. And the point is, I almost paid the highest grade full scale for that log until I walked around the other side and saw a different view on that log and I caught that. So that's why it's, the lesson as loggers is to hide that so we don't see it. The lesson as buyers is to walk around a little more careful so we do see it. 